there, Dave Keller here with Stock Charts, and thanks so much for joining us on this latest episode of Behind the Charts. Season two of Behind the Charts is featuring conversations with some of the top technical analysts uh, in the industry, people that have had incredible careers uh, of following charts, and, and really it's on their shoulders that people like me have been able to build uh, successful careers on. So I was really excited to sit down with Walt Diemer. Walter Diemer is a name that many of you probably know, and if not, you should. Walter is a gr one of the group of early technical analysts in Boston. Uh, he uh, started elsewhere, but really spent much of his career in the, uh, in the Boston area. He was a technical analyst with Jerry Sy, who left Fidelity and started the Manhattan Fund. After that, uh, Walter was the technical analyst at Putnam Investments in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there were three guys, uh, Walter Diemer uh, at Putnam, uh, Bill Diani at Wellington, and Bill Doan at Fidelity, who was one of my predecessors there. So we had a lot of fun talking about the early technical analysis community, how the group in Boston related to the MTA, which had just started in New York, and how the two of them uh, sort of connected to create uh, the global organization that the CMT Association uh, now is. But really his experiences of, of uh, analyzing the markets in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, all, the where to where we, uh, all the point to where we are today. Uh, Walter still is super generous on social media, sharing his latest observations, and recently posted all of his market letters from over three or four decades, all on a website we can all digest. It was a fascinating conversation from the historical perspective of a longtime technical analyst. Enjoy my conversation with Walter Diemer. So sitting down today with Walter Diemer, uh, Walter, I've known you for a number of years and, uh, and it is such a pleasure to sit down with you today. It's my honor, thanks for having me. I have, I have very fond memories uh, in my fidelity days of hosting you and, uh, and bringing you through the chart room there. And I, some of my favorite opportunities of talking markets were in some of those uh, visits. So it's good to chat with you a little bit more about your background. For those that don't know, can you get us, start us from the beginning. Where are you from originally? Uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Very good. And, and go ahead. Go ahead. And how did you first, what was your first uh, introduction to the financial markets? Was it right out of school? Was it early on? How did that happen for you? Well, strangely enough, I was, I was a weird kid. And at, uh, when I was 13 years old, I was living in Rhode Island and I had to take a ferry to Newport to get, get, get orthodontics work done on my teeth every couple of weeks. And I happened to go by a brokerage house on my trip. So I would stop in the brokerage house and uh, look at the tape. And the numbers fascinated me. I, I was always fascinated with numbers. So normal normal kids, um, you know, follow baseball players. I, I followed uh, the stock market as well. So I was following the stock market when I was a kid. And uh, not to age yourself, but around what time was that that you were following stocks for the first time? Uh, late 50s. Late 50s. And late then 50s. how did you, what was your professional entrance into the financial markets? Well, the professional entrance that uh, I went, I, I, I got hooked on technical analysis because I went to uh, Penn State and uh, I went to an, uh, the main campus for my last two years, 61, 62, and 63. And there was one brokerage office in town. So I sort of hung out there and watched the tape, kept a couple indicators and things like that. And uh, if you look in the, in the ancient history books, you'll see that in the uh, spring of 1962, the market crashed. And there, were, there was a technical guy at the brokerage office who was also an adjunct professor. And he was very much into technical analysis. Hmm. And he saw the thing coming a mile away with the advanced decline divergences and a bunch of other things. There was a big speculative peak in 1961 and all that good stuff. So I got interested in technical analysis and one day, I was riding home uh, uh, to Philadelphia to see my family, and I got this book out of the Penn State Library called A Daily Strategy for Stock Market Profits by Joe Granville. And Joe Granville is quite a salesman, and I just got hooked. I couldn't put the book down, so I started keeping indicators. So that was in 1962. Uh, when I got out of Penn State, they didn't teach technical analysis, so I created kind of my own course on technical analysis. Uh, I did an honors thesis on technical indicators versus leading economic indicators, which basically proved what we know all along. The stock market uh, is a leading economic indicator. So if you want to figure out what the economy is, is doing, follow the stock market. But you know, if you want to find out what the stock market is going to do, don't follow the economy. The technical indicators lead the stock market. 
So I go knock on doors on Wall Street and nobody was hiring te technicians, but I got into Merrill Lynch's research training program in, in 63. And then in, in April of 1964, that Archie Crawford, who was working for Bob Farrell at Merrill Lynch, announced he was going to quit as he was doing as he did every week. And he, he said, okay, okay, Arch, fine. What are the odd lots this morning? And I said, no, Bob, I really mean it. So he had only a week to find a replacement. And I was the only one that could find who didn't have to be trained for more than a week. So I jumped over a whole bunch of people and I started working for Bob Carroll in 1964. Very good. You glossed over and I, I, I'd forgotten the, uh, about your Penn State uh, alumni, being a Penn State alum, which my brother was as well. I great memories of visiting him in Happy Valley. I do want to point out your wife, Bobby, though, is an Ohio State fan. So let's let's get that out front and center while we can, okay? Well, and, and I think, do you have a connection with Ohio State, Dave? I, I, I did, in fact, attend the Ohio State University, Walter. Thank you. Did, did you ever make music there? <laughs> I did. I did perform well. Well, I want you to know, I root for Ohio State 51 weeks out of every year. Just the one week <laughs> they play Penn State, I don't root for. <laughs> Fair enough. Now you, you, so oh, you got, I O. So you got started with, uh, you know, really professionally in terms of technical analysis, Bob Carroll's team at Merrill Lynch. And it's, it's amazing. That is one of the, you know, there are a couple of big technical research firms on the, on the sell side, you know, Bob Carroll's team, Alan Shaw's at uh, Smith Barney, that many technical analysts and people who have gone on to great careers have gone through. You mentioned starting at, at Merrill Lynch, and you you started there really during what's called the go-go years, right? The 1960s, that bull market phase. Can you talk a little bit about your experience going through, you know, sort of getting started in a raging bull market, and then the 70s happened, which is a much different environment. What was that like for you? Well, it was it was a learning experience. I stayed at Merrill Lynch until uh, February 1966, when Jerry Sy left uh, Fidelity and started the Manhattan Fund and raised a then record $270 million. Uh, and I was hired when they filed, uh, when they increased the offering from 50 to $100 million. That's when they decided to have, have a manned technical department. So I watched the go-go years from the inside. And that uh, for, for years during the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, I would say, you know, people say the market looks speculative. I said, I have seen a speculative market in the same net, and I could I could get away with that until 1999 when the dot coms came along. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, how how wild was it? And uh, at one point in late '68 or early 1969, the American Stock Exchange tape ran 37 minutes late. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's and. Yeah, it was, you know, there were all sorts of crazy things and it got wild and it was crazy and you knew it at the time. The problem is that you know when speculative activity is excessive and you know it's finally going to end, but you don't know how excessive it's going to get before it finally ends. Mm. You know, just when you think it can't get any work, any crazier, something else happens like, I don't know, GameStop or something. Right, right. So you, uh, you know, working with Jerry Sy, the Manhattan Fund, and then eventually made your way to Putnam, because I think of you, Walter, as sort of the, um, you know, the Boston technical analysis community. When I was at Fidelity, sort of thought of you as the, um, you know, the, uh, the you know, spearheading that community in, in Boston before, you know, before I did. And that was, it was people like Bill Diani at, uh, at Wellington, Bill Doan at Fidelity, and then you, um, you know, at, at Putnam. Tell us a little bit about that and that transition to the Boston bicycle community. Well, it was kind of kind of fun because that uh, uh, Bill Doan, Bill Diani, and I uh, all headed major, fairly major technical efforts, and so when it, you know, anybody came to town, they saw all three of us, and then we get together afterwards and could swap notes and you know, figure out who had something to say and who didn't. Although being technical analysts, that you know, if you if you so you know if you show somebody that does something that one person will say it's great one person will say i don't know one person will say it's lousy so uh you know yeah but it, it, what we we sort of compared notes and also talked about how to get along with the fund managers who you know treated us badly uh you know at one point the uh the tr I was my, my office was right across from the uh, trading the trading room, which at that point had three traders. The whole Putnam Management Company had three traders back in those days, and 
uh, we decided that the head trader and I decided that, you know, that the fund managers never made mistakes. Any mistakes that were made were either the problem, fault of the technical department or the trading department. So we got together and we decided to do an every other week thing. One week they would blame everything on the technical department, and the next week they would bring every, blame everything on the trading department. I love it. Spread but, out you know, but, a little but, bit. <laughs> but more seriously, you know, technical analysis is kind of tough because you know we're analyzing real things. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my favorite sayings is price is everything. They don't seasonally adjust it, they don't you know change it or anything. You may not and probably don't agree with the price today, but that's what it is. And if you think the price is going up and it goes down, you can't go back and say, well, I'm going to seasonally adjust the sucker or something like that. It is what it is. So, you know, the chart, when you look at a chart, that's real stuff. Right. Now, you uh, you know, during this period, then, if I think about the 1970s, the 1974 low is something that I know I've looked back a lot, just historically trying to understand a you know a, a bottom in a secular bear market. Can you talk about what the environment, what the morale, what the general conditions? I mean, how was that period in terms of navigating that? Uh, you know, what ended up being the you know the bottom before the you know the raging eighties. What was that experience like? Well, as you might expect, the the, the morale was bad. The, the people were being left, left uh, laid off. Uh, uh, you know, nobody was buying funds. The assets under management were going down. It was not a happy time. And one of your one of my favorite quotes of yours that I refer to often in presentations is uh, when it's time to buy, et cetera, et cetera. Can you share that story about uh, a, a fund manager looking for when is the right time to get back in? <laughs> I was going to say, a book well, I, I know is uh, a beautiful uh, book uh, that you wrote as well with that title. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I, if, the funny thing about technical analysis, I think, Dave, is it, it's all rooted in in, in, uh, in in human behavior. And as Bob Farrell has pointed out, you know, every things may change, uh, vehicles may change, but human behavior doesn't change, and it, it and it doesn't. And it's just the way it is. So, you know, one day, you know, the market is staging what I think is a normal correction, which I happily had anticipated, and. As soon as it starts down, the fund managers start coming in uh, into my office and say, is it time to buy yet? I said, no. And the next day they came in and says, is it time to buy yet? Now. And I said, no. And finally, they get them off my back. I looked them in the eye and I said, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. <laughs> and you know, as, as fate would have it, that I wrote a book entitled when the time comes to buy you won't want to and published it in 2019 it is still available on amazon should anybody want to check it out and commercial um I, i'm trying to supplement my social security um and, and but the thing is the book was published in 1920 and, and 2019 mm -hmm. in 2020 we had this thing called the pandemic the market goes down something like 37% in six weeks or something like that. Yeah. And, and things were looking horrendous, as we know all too well. And I will guarantee you that when the bottom, when we got to the bottom, in hindsight, the day of the bottom, nobody was running around saying, this is the greatest buying opportunity of the last three years. I'm going to buy. This is terrific. Yeah, you, had to, you had to fly in the face of prevailing opinion which is really what I think technical analysis is all, is, is all about. That basically, uh, when, you, um, when, you're, when you have an opinion, it's usually the good opinions are flying in the face of conventional wisdom. Mm. You, uh, and we should mention your, uh, your other book that I, that I really appreciate is Beamer on Technical Analysis, really talks about you know, your, your, your wisdom that you've accumulated over your career. How would you describe your investment process when you, you know, when technical analysis can mean a lot of different things to different people. What, how would you define your investment process approaching the markets? Uh, mine is different than almost anybody because I'm aged. So that if the market, if you say, you know, if you say on a long-term basis to say, well, if you buy, you know, it doesn't matter if the market goes down in 10 years, you'll be ahead. Well, in 10 years, maybe they'll be ahead, but I don't know whether I'm going to be around. Probably not. So I have a shorter term and a more risk adverse uh, approach, and you know it doesn't, it won't, it won't work for ninety nine percent of the people who use uh, stock charts. I think. 
And so how would, you know, when, you, when I think of your career, then if we could talk about, um, you know, your time at Putnam in the, uh, you know, 70s and into the 80s, um, you know, how did your analysis of the equity markets evolve or how did you deal in particular with this transition to 1983, the Dow go, goes above 1,000 for the first time or, you know, finally gets above it for good. What was that transition like sort of as a, as a stock picker, as a market analyst going into the 80s and the 90s, which was sort of the, the raging bull market phase? Well, to, to be honest, you know, I don't think anybody foresaw the raging bull market in 19, beginning in 1982. Yeah. Uh, things were kind of bleak at the bottom, but you know, after after you know, twelve years almost of of, of a gradual you know sandpapering people to, to death, I don't think people were ready for you know a, an ongoing, relatively persistent bull market. Uh, it took some getting used to. Yeah. Um, when you think of your career, uh, Walter, you've gone through really, you've experienced so many different market environments, uh, bull markets in the 60s, the 80s, more recently here in the 2000s, uh, but also a couple of secular bear markets that were pretty painful. When you think about how you approach markets, what, what market conditions are most challenging for you and why? Today's, because I've never seen them before. <laughs> but, I, but, 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 but Mr. Keller, I say that every day. <laughs> you, you, could, you, you could have asked me that a year ago and I would have said today's and you Today. could ask me a year from now and I will say today's. It's always a challenge. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the thing is, whenever you think you've got this sucker figured out, uh, one of the sayings is whenever, whenever you find the key to the market, some son of a bitch comes along and changes the lock. <laughs> there we go. Now, I should mention, you know, when, when I'm thinking of you and your writings, I, one of the things I enjoyed with my time at Fidelity was being able to look at uh, the chairman's correspondence with different market analysts over time. You just recently have, uh, have posted a lot of your market uh, writings on, uh, I think it's DeemerMarketMemos.com, um, where yeah. you just put it out there. As you look back, I mean, it, it's an incredible repository of what a successful technical analyst was thinking in these, in these, in these different periods. When you look back at what you were thinking of what you were writing. Is there a particular period where you feel like you things made sense or where you you think your writings are or would illuminate what, how a technical analyst should have been approaching a certain market? No, I'll tell you the most humbling thing and <clears throat> is I came I came up with the concept of breakaway momentum back in 1973-74, which is what most people call a breadth thrust. But uh, Tony Tabell punched some numbers for me back in 73-74. And so breakaway momentum was an almost infallible indicator that when you got an extreme burst of momentum or breadth thrust, if you will, or breakaway momentum, uh, it inevitably happened only at the beginning of a major bull market uh, or only at the beginning of an intermediate up leg in a, in a bull market. So what happens, 19, uh, 2008 comes along, we have the great financial crisis. 2009 comes along, we get breakaway momentum. And I look at it and I say, well, here's breakaway momentum. It's nice, but this time is different because this is more like the 30s when breakaway momentum didn't work mm -hmm. rather than like the, you know, everything since, since World War II when it did work. Well, guess what? It worked. And it also, not only did it work, but it was generated. We got it three different times in 2009, which was telling you something, which mm -hmm. I was too stupid to listen to. So. <laughs> you know, this time is different. The, the most costly words in in investing history. The fatal words to say, right? As a fatal as a words. <laughs> um, I should note. So, as we're having this discussion, I'm using my MTA throwback mug from years ago uh, for my coffee. You were uh, participated in and were one of the you know sort of founding. Um, you know, members, early members of the Market Technicians Association. Can you tell a little bit about, you know, you obviously, I think we're, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, you know, between New York into Boston at that time. What was the beginning of that organization like for you and how did that evolve? Well, the Market Technicians Association really did, did two things. One, one is back in 1973 when it was formed, uh, technical analysts were, were, were considered the scum of the earth. Uh, we were looked down, we were looked down on uh, and, uh, and so the goal was to try to professionalize us. Mm. And the other thing was that most technicians didn't want to share their work. And so people would come into my office and say, well, my work 
says we're going to do, you know, is, is bullish. I said, well, what is proprietary? <laughs> well, I didn't want to listen to proprietary stuff because, you know, number one, I didn't know whether it was valid. And number two is that I was always comparing, you know, their work with other people's work, which is a nice thing uh, that I was able to do. And so the, thanks to the, the, the MTA, now the CMT Association, people share their work. Yeah. And I mean, the, you know, I look at stock charts and, you know, all the indicators are there that, you know, it would have all been hidden under, under, a, under a basket back 50 years ago. Yeah. And so it, it really, I mean, the, the, the people today don't, don't understand what, a, what an advantage they have in that all this knowledge is, free, is freely shared uh, among people. And the other thing is, you know, if you, subscribe to uh, a, a technical service you're not you don't have to get it in a plain brown wrapper <laughs> i love the way you just said that now i think a lot of people if they don't know uh they can follow you and your work on social media i know you're still posting com commentary on uh on twitter at walter deemer um and and i appreciate all that you continue to do to be visible and, and share some of your thinking you know, obviously, when you put something on social media, you're you're putting that in front of some people that are just getting started in the markets now. So when you when you think of someone who's just getting started, just learning technical analysis, what could you tell them? What words of wisdom or what uh, guidance would you give them as they start their journey of uh, of technically oriented analysis? Keep an open mind. Learn as much as you can. Listen to the people who have been there before. Uh, write down when you when you uh, make a trade. Write down whether it worked or not, and why. Because the thing is, in this business, we all make a lot of mistakes, and the trick is not making the same mistake a second time. And I have not gotten to that point. I have made a lot of mistakes, but I still find new ones to make. But avoiding making the same mistake a second time can be helpful. Mm. I love that. That's a perfect. Also, way to do. You're good. I would also, and I would also say, be humble. The market knows more than you do. Never, never force your opinion on the market. If you think the market is 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 crazy, that's fine. But don't fight it because the market basically is the sum of human wisdom, all focused on, in the old days, the corner of Broad and Wall, as Richard Russell once said. But it's the net sum of human wisdom, and it may be irrational, it may be crazy, but don't fight it. Uh, you know, it is what it is. You can go against it, but understand what you're doing. There's well, a certain there's a certain video game gaming retail stock that you know proves both on the upside and the downside that you, know, you can't you, you cannot fight you cannot fight it. You know, if it's going to well anyway. It's amazing how many of those patterns I think that you've probably seen over your career they can, they just continue to come up. The, the whole concept of, of bubbles inflating, bubbles quickly deflating. Uh, in some ways, you've seen this before in different tickers, different environments, but some of the same themes, right? Well, the, the, in the money game, that uh, <clears throat> uh, um, they, 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 Adam Smith wrote in the money game about one of your early, early predecessors at, uh, at, at, at Fidelity, Chester Pato. Yeah. And the, the uh, quote was, Chester's charts are singing because it was so good. But there's also a thing where he had a chart on the wall and he keep had, had, kept having the scotch tape, you know, additions to the chart going up the wall because it was going up so much. And it just, he just, it just went up and up and up. It was, it was like from two to 200 or something. Uh, that stock happened to be alpha numeric, which I don't think exists anymore, but you know, it, it went up and I think probably it went down. One of the things I put out on Twitter that got, an awful lot of attention was I had a chart lying around somewhere that I had, I had had an image of of RCA, which was the great growth stock of the late 1920s. Yeah. And I had a monthly chart of RCA from 1925 to 1935. And I posted the chart just saying that this is what a great growth stock looked like back in the 1920, late 1920s. And in round numbers, it went from 10 to 120 and back to 10 again. <laughs> we've seen and, it again we've seen it before and, we'll see it again and the, the, the other thing I would like to I, I should mention is my favorite chart of all time it's in every one of my books and it's posted on my website is McDonald's 
in the 1970s because one of the great speculative orgies uh, of all time was the nifty 50 growth stocks of the early 1970s when basically everything was else was going down it was in a it was in a, a, a secular bear market uh, but the nifty 50 growth stocks uh, were in their private bull markets and so McDonald's corporation at one point was selling at 75 times earnings um, and as it turned out in, in 1973 it was selling at 75 and the earnings for the next seven years went up at 25 percent per year compounded Every year, stock never missed a quarter, and the stock went from 75 to 38. Hmm. And it went at the bottom of selling at eight times earnings. Wow. So, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, stocks, you know, price is everything. And that's, that's what we as technical analysts analyze. We, I don't know what the earnings are. I mean, the, the old joke is uh, earnings at the, at the end of the quarter, the uh, uh, the president of the, of the company calls the, uh, the the chief accountant into his office and says, well, how much did we earn in the last quarter? What were our earnings per share? And the accountant says, what do you want them to be? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> but but the chair, but the president of the company does not call, call the, the, the treasurer and says, what's the price of the stock? And the treasurer says, what do you want it to be? It's not. It's what the market wants it to be. Two exactly different things. Right. Price is everything. Yeah. Walter, this has been absolutely fascinating. I, I so appreciate you giving us your time, sharing with us uh, some wisdom from a very successful career as a technical analyst. Thank you for everything you've done and continue to do to lift up the uh, the practice of technical analysis and provide opportunities for people like me to uh, to make it into a career. So thank you so, so much. Well, well, thank you for continuing to blaze the way for people behind you because you're 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 carrying the torch very ably, my friend. <laughs> all right, stay safe, Walter. Thanks. And I, and I hope you, and I hope Ohio State wins all but one of their football games next year. <laughs> hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.